to you from the Forge of Freedom studio in the heart of America, a podcast dedicated to preserving freedom and inspiring personal success. Freedom is born and lives through you, the individual, and it dies in the shadows of tyranny, motivating our listeners to become well-rounded, freedom-minded people with the body of an athlete, the mind of a stoic, and the spirit of a warrior. The Tree of Liberty lives on through you, the Forge of Freedom. And now, here's your host, Alex Uli. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Forge of Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Alex Uli, and this is episode 83 of the Forge of Freedom. In today's episode, Crossing Borders, Reflections on Our Trip to China, uh, is sort of a just a short episode with my thoughts about... Uh, our recent trip to China. Uh, my wife and I recently traveled for the wedding of a friend of mine from from law school. Um, we we met during law school orientation, and my friend uh, is from Beijing. He and his family live in Beijing, and and uh, he recently was married, uh, and. We had been planning to travel to to China for the wedding for a number of months, and uh, we were a little a bit uncertain if we'd get to go or not, uh, because my my wife is is pregnant, and at the time of the uh, our scheduled departure, she would have been nearly thirty weeks pregnant. Um, but we were able to go, and um, we we made the trip we we returned and and we had a, a great time and i just wanted to share some of my reflections about that trip uh, you may recall my, my wife whitney she was uh, on an episode a few months ago about a class that we took about trauma medicine uh, that we took it was a class that we took with greg elifritz and and we did a a review of that class and uh, I'll link to that in the show notes, but uh, we we kept some notes. Uh, we took a lot of pictures, and on the flight back in particular, I had some some thoughts that I thought were relevant for the show, and that I thought might be uh, good to share with with the audience here with with you. If um, uh, you know, you, you hear so much in the media about China, mostly negative. Uh, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. And it's true that, that the, the government there is very authoritarian, although less so than it was 50 years ago. Uh, it's still very authoritarian, but there are also significant elements of, of capitalism there and a sort of a, a free market spirit uh, among the population. So, and, and the people there are, are wonderful. Uh, despite the authoritarian nature of their government, uh, they're very welcoming, uh, very hardworking, very wonderful uh, people. And some of the best people I know. And uh, we were lucky and, and honored to attend the wedding. In fact, I got, I got to speak at the wedding, uh, which is an interesting uh, experience. But one of the first things that I noticed when we arrived, uh, I'd been to China in 2017, actually right after we took the bar exam, my friend and I, uh, I traveled to China with him, and uh, I was sort of interested to see how much it had changed, not just because of the passing of the years, but also because there was a pandemic between 2017 and, and today. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that as soon as we got off the plane, we had to go through their their customs, their their immigration uh, protocol, and their customs, and one of the first things you have to do is give your your fingerprints. At, and they have these kiosks lined up along a wall uh, where you give your fingerprints as you enter the country. So that was Orwellian, uh, very very creepy. Uh, something you'd you'd. Uh, think you might hear about in, in the night book of 1984 by, by George Orwell. Uh, but the other thing is that the, the airport was largely empty when we arrived, and it's a, a massive airport. And it just sort of 
demonstrates this massive sort of overbuilt infrastructure, uh, massive waste. Of course, the expectation is that they will grow into it, uh, I assume. Uh, But even in 2017, when travel was uh, more common, although it's picked up quite a bit by now, uh, it was very empty. So, you know, years have passed and, and the airport still seemed very empty. It was, it was a very eerie feeling. But the other thing that you immediately notice, and of course the United States is not good in this regard either, but the, the, one of the things you immediately notice is that there are cameras everywhere. And in the United States, obviously, we have a, a very large police state. Uh, there are very uh, few things we do that aren't monitored to some degree, uh, either through uh, social media, through our phones, through uh, cameras that are put up by the government, etc. And of course, actually just this week, uh, the Congress passed, I don't think it's been signed by the president yet, President Biden, but passed uh, the reauthorization of essentially warrantless spying on U.S. citizens. So uh, we don't have a whole lot to, to say here, although I think the Chinese government does it to a much greater degree. So we've got the, we've got the fingerprinting, We've got cameras everywhere and an empty airport, which is a a symptom, I think, of sort of this centrally planned economy. Uh, You know, there's this fatal conceit that this knowledge problem, uh, people from the top can't know how much of a thing to provide uh, because they don't have pricing mechanisms to with with that feedback about how much of a thing is needed. And so they massively overproduce things and massively underproduce others. Uh, Airport space being one of those things that they massively overproduce. Uh, The next thing, uh, my friend, his his cousin uh, and his friend showed up and, and picked us up at the airport to go to the rehearsal dinner. And in Beijing, there's a lot of wealth, but there's also a lot of poverty. And you notice there... Um, much like you do in the United States, but even to a greater degree, this huge disparity in wealth. I mean, uh, uh, our friend's cousin and his uh, one of his best friends picked us up uh, in a Mercedes SUV, a very nice vehicle. And yet, you know, you have people going to and from the city on dilapidated scooters, uh, just barely able to make it to and from the city each day to sell uh, piddly sums of produce that they grow on a farm outside of the city or uh, other types of uh, merchandise. And they're very uh, entrepreneurial, uh, these these folks, but you can tell they have very little resources and very little money. Uh, so you immediately notice, uh, as soon as you leave the airport, this massive disparity in wealth, uh, you know, Massive skyscrapers, uh, very nice cars almost everywhere, almost indistinguishable from the cars you might see in New York City, uh, in in many cases much nicer. So uh, even in a country that is run by the Communist Party, which has its foundations in equality, uh, sort of this ideal of equality, you have massive disparities in wealth. And you sort of see this clash, this tension uh, between the authoritarian communist dictates that, that uh, uh, the, the government imposes and the more capitalist elements of the, the society there because uh, both, both elements are very strong, but you can tell that the, the, the government acts as a huge break on the progress that has occurred in China in the last uh, 30 years, especially. The other thing is that it's hard to, it's hard to wrap your head around just the huge 
population that exists there in China uh, and in very small areas. Uh, Beijing is a large city, but I mean, we're talking about 20 plus million people uh, in Beijing. And it's just something that's hard to to comprehend uh, the number of people that, that are there. And uh, when we went to the rehearsal dinner the first night, we the, the, the dinner was at a restaurant in this massive mall that far bigger than any mall I'd been to here in the United States. I'd, I've never been to Mall of America in, in Minnesota, but I, I expect that it's something on that sort of scale. It's, it's a massive, massive mall. Uh, but when we arrived at the rehearsal dinner, uh, obviously it was amazing to see uh, my friend Shaw for the first time in, in six years, over six years. Uh, it was great to see him. We'd stayed in touch um, by video call primarily and, uh, and text message. But uh, not having seen him for over six years, it was, it was great to see him again. But uh, at the rehearsal dinner, it was you know, lots of his friends and, and uh, family. And what I love about the meals in China, the, the food is excellent, sometimes a bit exotic, but excellent nevertheless. But I love their hot pot style meals because they're very engaging. Um, you have to, in, in their family style, you have to engage with other people at the table. Um, and they sort of emphasize taking your time and, and enjoying the food. And I love that element that, that of their culture that sort of persisted. Uh, and I think it was refreshing. You know, we'd just been on this long trip, uh, and we were immediately greeted by uh, our good friend and some of his friends to, to share a meal. And one thing that we learned, uh, if not immediately, certainly by the time the trip was over, was that the Chinese people don't want you to leave the table hungry. They will continue to bring you food as long as you eat it. Uh, so that was a, a, fun, a fun thing, and we certainly ate our fair share. So there's this, obviously, I think in the United States, this perception that the Chinese are our enemy, but that's not at all the impression that you get when you're, when you're there, when you're among the everyday people. Uh, they're incredibly gracious people, incredibly friendly, incredibly welcoming and they share many of the same values that we share here. Yet, they have a government who is, that is quite, quite oppressive. And unfortunately, I see elements of our government moving more and more that way, more and more authoritarian. Another interesting thing that uh, we saw while we were there, we visited Tiananmen Square, which is sort of the, the heart of of government there in China, in Beijing in particular. And Tiananmen Square, of course, was the, the there's a famous picture of a, a man uh, standing in front of tanks on, on Tiananmen Square protesting the, the authoritarian government of the day. And today, people still attempt to protest at Tiananmen Square. And, and as we entered the area, uh, Xiao, my friend, told me, he said, you know, don't take pictures of this or that building because they're official government buildings and, and people may, they, undercover police or what have you may come up to you and, and ask to, to see your phone or take your phone or, or uh, something like that. And so that was, first of all, interesting um you know you don't feel like you have the freedom there to um document what the government is up to you know they see everything that you're doing through all of the cameras and uh, censorship that they have going on there but 
you can't look at everything that they're doing. But the other thing is you have to go through security to get into the to the area there around Tiananmen Square. And they had recently been experiencing some protests with white paper. They were called white paper protests. And the idea behind the protests was that they weren't allowed to say things with words so that they would protest with blank sheets of white paper. And those blank sheets of white paper resembled the tyranny of the government, the the government's oppression of free speech. And so they checked our bags to make sure that we weren't carrying white paper. And of course, they were also checking to make sure that we were not journalists. On the day that we, I sort of skipped ahead a little bit here, this was the last day that we were there when we visited Tiananmen Square. We happened to be carrying more with us than we had been the previous days because we had just checked out of the hotel and had to carry some of our things around with us. So I think that maybe they thought we were we were journalists uh, or protesters because we had uh, backpacks with us uh, with more things than, than most people were carrying. So that was another interesting aspect. We also, <laughs> while we were there, we had decent... Uh, cell phone coverage. We, we were able to to use uh, a cell phone while we were there, but if you were connected to uh, internet without a VPN, I mean, you c- can't access a lot of the things that we access here in the United States. Um, just websites like like Google, for instance, um, or even some email is blocked. Dropbox is blocked. I use Dropbox to to sync pictures or to back up pictures while I'm traveling. Things like that, services like that are blocked. Uh, so you you don't appreciate the amount of freedom we have to use the internet in the United States until you don't have it, until much of it is blocked without some uh, technical ability to connect with a VPN. The other thing that I noticed, and this is a bit of a contrast from 2017, back in 2017, uh, digital payment was so, sort of on the rise, but many people still used cash. This year, they use, I, I didn't see anybody use cash. Even the uh, local street vendors, the people who came in from the country, uh, accepted payment by digital method, which primarily they use either WeChat, which is a, a messaging system platform uh, in China, or Alipay, which is a, a payment system run by Alibaba. So that was interesting. They pay with a QR code uh, on their phone. And restaurants, street vendors, coffee shops, uh, salons, all these places, digital payment with a QR code, usually WeChat, at least in Beijing. Another interesting experience that we had was uh, at the wedding. It was great. I, I got to sp- to meet and speak with a lot of my uh, my friends' family. One of which was his grandmother, who lives in a, a more rural area. Uh, she, she didn't speak any English, but it was a sort of a a memorable moment for me because she appreciated us being there and so that was very very sweet some of the things that she had to to say about our presence there but you could tell that she was also sort of um she was a very family oriented person and a person that you could tell had very strong character and very strong values uh, and it was just a wonderful thing to see sort of the strength of the family there, and you could tell that it stemmed largely from my friend's grandparents. While we were at the wedding, uh, we were seated at tables. Uh, it was the same table. The, the wedding was in the same place where the sort of reception took place, where the meal took place, and uh, I was sitting next to a, a gentleman who I'd never met prior to this trip. 
but he was he had good English and we were able to converse a fair amount. And I was asking him questions about the government and, and government cens- censorship and, and questions that sort of called into question the legitimacy of the government. And as I was asking him these questions, you could tell that he sympathized with my criticism and my viewpoints, but you could also tell that he was anxious, that he was nervous because he began tapping his his foot and he was sort of guarded in his uh, language. And I'm not sure if it's because he was afraid the government might hear him or get wind of the conversation or, or the things that we were saying, or if he thought maybe I was some uh, spy, I'm not sure, but, but that left an impression on me. And again, going back to the point I made earlier about having access to the internet, uh, the other thing that we often take for granted in the United States, even though I'm very critical of our government and think that they're awful in so many ways, we still have a, a good deal of freedom here that, that others in countries like China do not enjoy. And we take it for granted because in moments like those, when you realize that you have to be careful about criticizing the government, I at least realize and appreciate more our ability to speak in the United States, no matter how much the government tries to oppress it. And I think there's a hunger for, for that in China that uh, people there, most of them, at least the more wealthy portions of the population, know what's going on in the outside world because they know how to access the Internet with a VPN. So despite huge efforts by the government to curate information, to spread propaganda, and to control the flow of information, people are never le- nevertheless able to bypass those efforts in many regards, and in such a degree that the government can't enforce their policy against VPNs, for instance. Uh, it's a it's basically a form of nullification uh, because the the citizens are protesting at large by using a VPN and the government can't enforce it. It's a prime example of the effectiveness of nullification. And I, th- I think that, that that's an example that we could use here in lots of ways, especially for unconstitutional federal government action, which of course, abounds in many facets of our life. So why am I talking about this? I think it's interesting um, for me just to sort of reflect on the freedom that we have here in the United States that we sometimes take for granted, but also to appreciate the, the efforts that people are making in other areas around the world to bypass authoritarianism in the world. And I also want to sort of convey the message that, yeah, the, the, the Chinese government is awful in so many ways, but the people of China have a wonderful heart uh, that even in some of the worst governments, in the places with the worst governments, rather, you can find some of the most wonderful people. And they treated us like royalty. They treated us with grace and humility. And I can't, I mean, I can't express enough how touched I was by the way they treated me and the way they treated my, my wife and our, our future son. There is goodness Wherever you look, as long as you look for it, no matter how authoritarian the government is. And there are good people, people filled with hope and kindness, and people who want a better world just like we do. So I guess part of this, uh, the point of this podcast is to reflect on sort of the, the goodness of the people amidst the authoritarianism 
of the government. And uh, obviously I'm not, I'm, I'm sharing just snippets of our trip. I had over a 10,000 word journal about the trip uh, with many other thoughts. Uh, but the bottom line here is that even the most authoritarian governments can't constrain good people who are seeking positive change. And I was inspired by what I saw in China in lots of ways and the progress that people are making there. I think that the government is going to try even harder to crack down uh, in the future, uh, just like they will here. But where freedom lives in the hearts and minds of the people, it can't be locked down by any person or any government. So don't take your freedom for granted, because once you lose it, it's hard to win it back, and it may take generations to get it back. Protect it while you can. Fight to get back the freedoms we've lost, and stay vigilant. One last thought that I forgot to mention was this. I asked my friend, he's an attorney in China, about property ownership, real property, so land and, and homes, etc. And there is no real property ownership in China. You, you basically have a grant for 70 years um, of so-called ownership. But it reminded me of arguments for basically a 100% wealth tax in Indiana. They're not quite, or in Indiana, in the United States, they're not quite the same, but, but they're similar in many regards. And the problem, and this was a point that I saw made by uh, Milton Friedman, is that especially with a 100% inheritance tax, the problem is that if people know that the wealth they build, the wealth they accumulate through life is not going to transfer to their children, they don't have much incentive to leave behind any wealth, to produce wealth in the first place even. And so they tend to consume the wealth that they create and waste many resources or, like I said, not even to create the resources in the first place. And so I think that it, it creates basically a cycle of consumption and expenditure without any accumulation of wealth and no increase in pro long-term prosperity. And we see that as a symptom of lots of policies of government, but uh, you could see it especially in China because, I mean, why would people buy and improve land, buy and improve real property if it was just going to go back to the government after a grant of 70 years? And so I, I thought that, that that was an interesting thing to reflect on as well as, as property rights because those are some of the most fundamental rights that we have or uh, the, the rights, the right to our, our body and by extension to the, to the property that we have and own through our home and, and the land that we are able to accumulate. Uh, but it's interesting to me. I, I asked my friend about it and he said, there's got to be some reform because the people who have purchased property are going to be basically rioting in the streets if the government doesn't change the policy. Because when that 70 years comes around, those people are going to expect to be able to keep their property. So it'll be interesting to see how that that develops. But anyway, so that's that's where I'll leave it for now. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. I've just, like I said, wanted to provide some of my reflections on on the trip. Uh, you know, it's a it's an interesting place, China. It's they have an amazing history there, an old history that their culture has traditions and history that have passed on for many generations. You know, it's not uncommon for families there to to know their lineage for tens if not dozens of generations. So uh, it's, it's really a, a neat place historically. Of course, they've suffered many um, 
tragic generations of loss and famine and and uh, and war. Uh, but I'm optimistic for uh, the people there if they can shed themselves of the shackles the government has pla- have placed on them. I think there's a lot of potential. Obviously, they're going through some tough times now, but uh, I think the younger generations especially see that that the government um, is a huge burden on progress and prosperity in China. So I, I hope that they can uh, make some progress and, and continue to step toward freedom. And it, it doesn't happen all at once. It has to happen in in small steps with the individual efforts of people like you and me. So um, bear that in mind. Like I said earlier, don't take your freedom for granted. Fight for it. Stay vigilant. All right, everybody. Thanks for, for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe to help us spread the message of freedom. Uh, and until next time, remember, you are the Forge of Freedom. Thanks for listening to this episode of Forge of Freedom. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss a future episode. For more information or to connect with Alex, you can go to forgeoffreedom.com or follow him on Twitter at Forge of Freedom. Until next time, remember, you are the Forge of Freedom.